Thought Vibration, or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World. Book by William Walker Atkinson. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1906. This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 3. A Talk About the Mind. Man has but one mind, functions along two lines of mental effort, passive effort often result of vibratory impulses imparted in ages long past, active effort newborn, thought impulse and motion. Impulse result of active effort, active function creates. Passive function obeys orders and suggestions, active function sends forth vibrations, the force of habit, appetency, the impulse of the primal cause, life force. Mental culture and mental development. Two different things, the amenability of the mind to the will, the will the outward manifestation of the I am, the attraction of the absolute, the real man the master, active and passive functions. But tools. Man has but one mind, but he has many mental faculties, each faculty being capable of functioning along two different lines of mental effort. There are no distinct dividing lines separating the two several functions of a faculty, but they shade into each other as do the colors of the spectrum. An active effort of any faculty of the mind is the result of a direct impulse imparted at the time of the effort. A passive effort of any faculty of the mind is the result of either a preceding active effort of the same mind, an active effort of another along the lines of suggestion. Thought vibrations from the mind of another. Thought impulses from an ancestor. Transmitted by the laws of heredity, including impulses transmitted from generation to generation from the time of the original vibratory impulse imparted by the primal cause, which impulses. Gradually unfold and unsheath when the proper state of evolutionary development is reached. The active effort is newborn, fresh from the mint, whilst the passive effort is of less recent creation and, in fact, is often the result of vibratory impulses imparted in ages long past. The active effort makes its own way, brushing aside the impeding vines and kicking from its path the obstructing stones. The passive effort travels along the beaten path. A thought impulse, or motion impulse, originally caused by an active effort of faculty, may become by continued repetition, or habit, strictly automatic. The impulse given it by the repeated active effort developing a strong momentum, which carries it on, along passive lines until stopped by another active effort or its direction changed by the same cause. On the other hand, thought impulses or motion impulses continued along passive lines may be terminated or corrected by an active effort. The active function creates, changes, or destroys. The passive function carries on the work given it by the active function and obeys orders and suggestions. The active function produces the thought habit or motion habit and imparts to it the vibrations which carry it on along the passive lines thereafter. The active function also has the power to send forth vibrations which neutralize the momentum of the thought habit or motion habit. It also is able to launch a new thought habit or motion habit with stronger vibrations which overcomes and absorbs the first thought or motion and substitutes the new one. All thought impulses or motion impulses once started on their errands continue to vibrate along passive lines until corrected or terminated by subsequent impulses imparted by the active function. Or other controlling power. The continuance of the original impulse adds momentum and force to it and renders its correction or termination more difficult. This explains that which is called the force of habit. I think that this will be readily understood by those who have struggled to overcome a habit which had been easily acquired. The law applies to good habits as well as bad. The moral is obvious. Several of the faculties of the mind often combine to produce a single manifestation. A task to be performed may call for the combined exercise of several faculties, some of which may manifest by active effort and others by passive effort. The meeting of new conditions, new problems, calls for the exercise of active effort. Whilst a familiar problem or task can be easily handled by the passive effort without the assistance of his more enterprising brother. There is in nature an instinctive tendency of living organisms to perform certain actions, the tendency of an organized body to seek that which satisfies the wants of its organism. This tendency is sometimes called appetency. It is really a passive mental impulse, originating with the impetus imparted by the primal cause and transmitted along the lines of evolutionary development. 
gaining strength and power as it progresses. The impulse of the primal cause is assisted by the powerful upward attraction exerted by the absolute. In plant life this tendency is plainly discernible, ranging from the lesser exhibitions and the lower types to the greater and the higher types. It is that which is generally spoken of as the life force in plants. It is, however, a manifestation of rudimentary mentation, functioning along the lines of passive effort. In some of the higher forms of plant life there appears a faint color of independent life action, a faint indication of choice of volition. Writers on plant life relate many remarkable instances of this phenomenon. It is, undoubtedly, an exhibition of rudimentary active mentation. In the lower animal kingdom a very high degree of passive mental effort is found. And, varying in degree in the several families and species, a considerable amount of active mentation is apparent. The lower animal undoubtedly possesses reason only in a lesser degree than man, and, in fact, the display of volitional mentation exhibited by an intelligent animal is often nearly as high as that shown by the lower types of man or by a young child. As a child, before birth, shows in its body the stages of the physical evolution of man, so does a child, before and after birth, until maturity, manifest the stages of the mental evolution of man. Man, the highest type of life yet produced, at least upon this planet, shows the highest form of passive mentation. And also a much higher development of active mentation than is seen in the lower animals. And yet the degrees of that power vary widely among the different races of men. Even among men of our race the different degrees of active mentation are plainly noticeable. These degrees not depending by any means upon the amount of culture, social position, or educational advantages possessed by the individual. Mental culture and mental development are two very different things. You have but to look around you to see the different stages of the development of active mentation in man. The reasoning of many men is scarcely more than passive mentation, exhibiting but little of the qualities of volitional thought. They prefer to let other men think for them. Active mentation tires them, and they find the instinctive, automatic, passive mental process much easier. Their minds work along the lines of least resistance. They are but little more than human sheep. Among the lower animals and the lower types of men, active mentation is largely confined to the grosser faculties, the more material plane. The higher mental faculties working along the instinctive, automatic lines of the passive function. As the lower forms of life progressed in the evolutionary scale, they developed new faculties, which were latent within them. These faculties always manifested in the form of rudimentary passive functioning and afterwards worked up through higher passive forms, until the active functions were brought into play. The evolutionary process still continues, the invariable tendency being toward the goal of highly developed active mentation. This evolutionary progress is caused by the vibratory impulse imparted by the primal cause, aided by the uplifting attraction of the absolute. This law of evolution is still in progress, and man is beginning to develop new powers of mind, which, of course, are first manifesting themselves along the lines of passive effort. Some men have developed these new faculties to a considerable degree, and it is possible that before long man will be able to exercise them along the line of their active functions. In fact, this power has already been attained by a few. This is the secret of the Oriental occultists and of some of their Occidental brethren. The amenability of the mind to the will can be increased by properly directed practice. That which we are in the habit of referring to as the strengthening of the will is in reality the training of the mind to recognize and absorb the power within. The will is strong enough, it does not need strengthening, but the mind needs to be trained to receive and act upon the suggestions of the will. The will is the outward manifestation of the I am. The will current is flowing in full strength along the spiritual wires, but you must learn how to raise the trolley pole to touch it before the mental car will move. This is a somewhat different idea from that which you have been in the habit of receiving from writers on the subject of willpower, but it is correct. As you will demonstrate to your own satisfaction if you will follow up the subject by experiments along the proper lines. The attraction of the absolute is drawing man upward, and the vibratory force of the primal impulse has not yet exhausted itself. The time of evolutionary development has come when man can help himself. The man who understands the law can accomplish wonders by means of the development of the powers of the mind. Whilst the man who turns his back upon the truth will suffer from his lack of knowledge of the law. 
He who understands the laws of his mental being, develops his latent powers and uses them intelligently. He does not despise his passive mental functions, but makes good use of them also, charges them with the duties for which they are best fitted, and is able to obtain wonderful results from their work, having mastered them and trained them to do the bidding of the higher self. When they fail to do their work properly, he regulates them, and his knowledge prevents him from meddling with them unintelligently and thereby doing himself harm. He develops the faculties and powers latent within him and learns how to manifest them along the line of active mentation as well as passive. He knows that the real man within him is the master to whom both active and passive functions are but tools. He has banished fear and enjoys freedom. He has found himself. He has learned the secret of the I am. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.